Our scripture this morning has been read, so I would like to ask you to open your Bible so that you can follow along as we present the message from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 through 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 through 18. The title of my message today is simply this, An Antidote for Escapism. An Antidote for Escapism. Who of us at one time or another has not felt like the psalmist when he said, Oh, for wings like a dove to fly away and rest. I would fly to the far-off deserts and stay there. I would flee to some refuge from all this storm. The scripture that we have for us today is written by one of God's servants who must have known what it was like to face the temptation of praying that prayer from Psalm 55, Oh, for wings like a dove to fly away and rest. When we read further in 2 Corinthians to chapter 11, we see the times in Paul's life when he faced the temptation of escapism, frequent imprisonments, frequent floggings, frequent exposure to death, five times the 39 lashes, three times beaten with rods, once stoned, three times shipwrecked, a day and night on the open sea, probably floating on a board, constantly on the move, in danger from rivers, bandits, fellow Jews, Gentiles, in danger in the city, in the country, at sea, from false brethren, hard work with sleeplessness, hunger and thirst, nakedness and cold, pressure of concern for the churches. I wonder if Paul had had available to him the modern course based upon Psalm 55, O for wings like a dove, if he would not have used it. I'll fly away, O glory. Some glad morning, I'll fly away. But we are linked, as was Paul, we are all linked to Adam and to Jesus. And our linkage with Adam, being descended from him in the human flesh, means that the suffering, the death that is present, the tension that is in our work, the human frustration, that's part of what we face. And because we are linked to Jesus, we also face the consequences of being allied with him. For Paul, it was to face continual hardship. For us, it may be to tell the truth in our employment situation and risk being laid off or not promoted. It may be to not join the crowd to face the ridicule of a stand with Christ. Whether we are facing pressure because of our linkage to Jesus or to Adam, what is the antidote to an escapist attitude? What do we do in those times when we are pressed to the wall and say, oh, I would give anything to escape from this? This scriptural passage this morning gives us five antidotes to escapism truths that lived in the Apostle Paul's heart as they were made real by the Spirit. The first antidote to escapism is that we consider the treasure that is in us. Verse 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay or vessels of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are the clay pot. The treasure is the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The treasure is the good news of the gospel. The Lord's treasures could have been stored in vessels of gold and silver, but he's chosen to store them in us, clay pots, that is to say, persons who are made out of the dust and who will return to the dust. One biblical commentator has suggested that the earthen vessels that Paul is referring to here were small pottery lamps, cheap and fragile, that could be bought in the shops of Corinth. The followers of Christ are likened to such fragile lamps, such fragile clay lamps, because they bear in their frail mortal bodies a light derived from the central source of Jesus Christ. Paul knew what it was like to be the least of the apostles, the chiefest of sinners, to have in his flesh dwelling no good thing. And he recognized that whatever was commendable in him came from the Lord. There was no celebrity status of glorying in the clay pot. The glory was in the Lord. 
And when we see the Lord use someone who profoundly touches our lives, we always need to take care that we avoid the celebrity status of glorying in the person, but that when we hear what God has done in the person, that we glory in the Lord. We consider this when we are tempted to escape, that those without Jesus are simply clay pots, and to the dust they'll return, and that's all they ever are. But we who know the Lord have a treasure that will endure, and will endure because we are part of God's treasure in us. A second antidote to escapism that Paul gives is that simply when we are at the end of our resources, God is not at the end of his. When we, when we have reached the end of our limitations, God has not reached the end of his. Verses 8 and 9 show us that the Christian life does not provide for us immunity from the harsh reality of living. Paul uses, in fact, four verbs to describe this harsh reality of living. The word pressed, which is a word we looked at when we opened the Second Corinthian letter, thlipsis. It means persecution, suffering, to be put into a vice, to be squeezed, to be perplexed, to be persecuted or hunted down, to be struck down. William Barclay says of these four words, and how Paul deals with them, that we are sore pressed at every point, but we are not hemmed in. We are at our wit's end, but we are never at hope's end. We are persecuted by others, but never abandoned by God. In fact, Paul specifically says later in his life, as he probably is in the Mamertine prison in Rome, his last letter to Timothy, verse 17 of chapter 4, the Lord stood by me and gave me strength. He was hunted down by others, but never abandoned by the Lord. And Barclay Forth says that we are knocked down, but not knocked out. And we realize how vital our attitudes are when we face a perplexing situation or a difficult situation. And Paul simply has, as the Spirit gives it to him, this mental attitude that simply indicates the Spirit in us causes us to say we need never surrender, never surrender. We may be pressed about on all sides, but we'll find God will give us breathing space. We may be perplexed as to why something is happening to us, and how many times do we ask that question, why? But in the midst of our perplexment, we have hope. We may feel like we're hunted down and the bad breaks have gone against us, but we know that because of Jesus, we are not abandoned. And we may have been given a knockout blow, but we are only knocked down. We are not knocked out because of the Lord. The hymn writer Annie Johnson Flint so eloquently described this, and I think she was referring to verses 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians 4 when she wrote this song. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy to multiplied trials his multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. A third antidote to escapism that Paul gives us is that we as Christians live by the principle of death to self. That's the focus of verses 10, 11, 12, and 15. If we are going to share in the life of Christ, then we also share in the death of Christ. If we are going to reign with him, we are also going to suffer with him. Paul's whole point in these verses is that his service to Christ had cost him something. In fact, it had cost him everything. He could have, as a man, as a human being, simply chosen to give nominal service to the Lord, but he chose to take up his cross and obey the word of the Lord by denying himself. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it eloquently years ago during the Nazi Holocaust, when as a prisoner he was held, if anyone would come after me, he says of Jesus, if any man would come after me, let him come and die. 
the whole principle of effective Christian service that Paul is driving out as an antidote to escapism is that the one who effectively, most effectively serves the Lord is the person who is evaluated where their treasure is and what their priorities are. And Paul has looked at his priorities in life and said, there are some things I can do without so that others can have. And there are people in this church who have taken that same attitude and as I look around uh, in the congregation, both at 8.30 and 11 o'clock, I realize that there's always a danger in naming names. But I can think of people like Linda Gross, who in order to reach Hmong children has significantly given of her resources, of her time, of her energy, of her health, of her finances, in order to practice death, personal death to her, that life might flow out of her to others. I think of people like Harry and Pauline Dalby who have so radically changed many of our views of retirement. We thought, oh, if we can just get to the time, some of us that are younger, when we're retired and have enough income and just settle back and take it easy and weekend it all the time. And here's a couple that could do exactly that, but have given full time of themselves to the work of the Lord so that through that denial of self, life might flow into this church and flow into others. I think of Ken and Ruth Dutro sitting down here who I was talking to yesterday morning at our pancake breakfast and they were telling me a dream of a new ministry that God had put on their heart within the church. And I said, but my goodness, you're already involved in so many things within the life of this church. They could weekend it too. But they've chosen to deny themselves of some things in order that through that act of dying, life might flow to others. There are many of you that have made commitments of time. You could use that for your own purposes, for your own self-enhancement, but you've chosen by allocating your time to the service of the body of Christ to practice some death to self that life might flow through to others. The same could be said in the sphere of finances, death to self, so that life might flow to others, doing without that others might have. Arthur T. Pearson, the great minister and writer, commentator once asked George Mueller, who founded the orphanages in, in England that were so marked by faith and by prayer, said to the great George Mueller, what's the secret of your work and the wonderful things that God has done through you? And George Mueller looked up for a moment and then bowed his head lower and lower until it actually hung between his knees. He was silent for a minute or two and then he told Arthur Pearson, many years ago there came a day in my life when George Mueller died. As a young man, I had many ambitions, but there came a day when I died to all these things, and I said, henceforth, Lord Jesus, not my will, but thine. And from that day, God began to work in and through me. The great evangelist J. Wilbur Chapman asked General William Booth, who founded the Salvation Army, to tell him the secret of his great work. And General Booth replied, Dr. Chapman, when I was a lad of 17, I determined that God should have all there was of William Booth. None of self, but all of thee. Our death is producing life elsewhere. And what goes for attitudes in respect to ministry toward others goes as well to attitudes within our family life. That sometimes in order for a relationship, a marriage, or a family to flourish, someone must yield what they feel is rightfully theirs and make a commitment to deny self that life might flow into someone else. There's a sign on Hoover Dam that commemorates the fact that many persons working on Hoover Dam lost their lives. And the plaque that is on Hoover Dam today commemorates them in saying of them, these died that the desert might blossom as a rose. Paul had an attitude of giving of self to others that kept him from escapism. Because when we live only for self, and things get bad, then we really have nothing greater than that driving us, simply self, and that's not enough. But it was with an eye of service toward the Lord and service to others that produced death in self and life in others. The fourth great antidote to escapism is in verses 13 and 14. Simply this, Jesus is risen. That helps us evaluate everything. Paul quotes from Psalm 116 in his statement, I believe, therefore I have spoken. If you look back to Psalm 116, you'll find it to be the prayer of one 
who was entangled in the cords of death and the anguish of the grave. And that psalm in the midst of that terrible illness reflects a man who has faith in God. Paul says, with that same spirit of faith, only a greater measure of faith, because now we have Jesus, we speak, and therefore, we believe, and therefore speak. What are we saying when we come to insurmountable times? We're saying, this problem may be beyond me, this is greater than me, but nothing is greater than the power of Jesus Christ. And if Jesus is risen from the dead, then I can evaluate all things in light of that great event. Jesus is risen, therefore greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. These four antidotes to escapism that we have looked at so far are simply that when we are tempted to escape, we stop for a moment and ponder that we have this treasure in us, that when we are at the end of our resources, we are not at the end of God's, that we live by the principle of death to self, and we live with the knowledge that Jesus is risen. And fifth and finally, our antidote to escapism is that our eyes are upon the invisible and the eternal, verses 16, 17, and 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. There's that word again, do not lose heart, which we looked at last week, the same word in verse 1. We do not bad out. We do not drop out. We do not burn out. Even though outwardly we are wasting away, or we may feel like the little Sunday school kid that said, I wonder what I was begun for when I am so soon done for. Considering the outward nature of passing away, inwardly we are being renewed. Our life is becoming stronger in the Lord as our bodies become weaker physically. Paul then says, as he measures that, that our current suffering our current thipsis or pressure or outward squeezing is light and it's momentary. Verse 17, two things to describe the pressure we're feeling. It's both light and it's momentary. You say, well, Paul could all, all well and good and say that the pressures bearing against him were light, but you should see the pressures that are against me. Consider again the pressures that he faced that he called light. Frequent imprisonments, frequent floggings, frequent exposure to death, being whipped five times with the 39 lashes, three times beaten with rods, once stoned, three times shipwrecked, a day and a night in the sea, etc., etc. He calls all of these light. Why does he call them light? Because Paul lived as a Christian with this mental imagery of life on a scale. And on one side of the scale is all the pressures and the problems now. And on the other side of the scale, is the eternal weight of glory that God is preparing for us. And our problem, if we forget what's on this side of the scale, is to let this side of the present moment outweigh the future. But when glory is put upon the scale, when it shall appear to us that we shall finally be what God has called us to be, changed forever into the nature of Jesus Christ, living eternally with him when we have tasted one minute of heaven, it will make everything, by comparison, seem light and momentary. That's what Paul is getting a hold of. Therefore, we can endure, because this momentary lightness of suffering is working out for us, literally, hyperbole unto hyperbole, eternal weight of glory. It's almost impossible to translate what he's saying here, but he's saying it's surpassingly, excessively surpassing weight of glory that is coming to us as the sons and daughters of God. When D.L. Moody was dying, great American evangelist, he looked up and his last words were simply this, earth is receding, heaven is approaching, this is my crowning day. And this last week, uh, members of our family and Elsie and Doris and my brother and I have spent a lot of time in an intensive and there have been hours when we did not know if Dad was going to pull through or he wasn't going to pull through, and it's not an easy thing to see someone you love suffer with all that poking that's going on that has to go on with all the needles coming in and the like. But we know, as we're with Dad, that the present suffering is not to be compared to the glory that is coming. When Christians are in trouble, they have something that non-Christians never have. Christians are in trouble, they have Jesus. They have his promise. They have the certainty of his resurrection. They have the joy of knowing that sins are forgiven. 
that our habitation is eternally with God, that in God we live and move and have our being, and everything is measured by that. Paul, therefore, says we live by the things not that are seen, but the things that are unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And we have to ask ourselves when we read a scripture like that, are we letting the realities that govern our life be the things that are seen or the things that are unseen? What drives us most? The things we can see or the things we cannot see, but which are nevertheless true. You may have come here today facing things that you felt like escaping from. And God has given you a scripture to put within your heart and to give you courage in the battle and tell you to go out from this place in triumph because the Lord is never going to abandon you and whatever you're suffering now is not to be compared with what God has laid up for you as his child. Our gracious Father, we come to you in this moment and we ask your blessing upon our lives as we take your word into our hearts. Sometimes, Lord, when the water of your word is offered to us, we may turn it aside because in that particular moment we are not thirsty. But if our hearts have come today thirsty, we pray that this water of your word will become something very cool and refreshing and joyous to our lives, that we may drink it in, all of it, Lord, I pray especially for that person here today that is being called to die to self so that they may have time to give to you. Help us, Lord, to evaluate what we're doing with our time, what we're doing with our money, what we're doing for ourselves versus what we can do for you and for others. Help us to know that it's only when we give ourselves away that we are really truly happy and truly joyous. There are others here, Lord, who need to do some dying in some personal relationships within marriage and family, who need to quit standing on their rights and what makes them happy, and what satisfies them, and what will bring them joy. And lay that aside, and like you, take a towel and wash the feet of somebody in their family, maybe their wife or husband. Deliver us, Lord, from an attitude of relationships that lives from what can I get out of this? What are you doing for me? Am I happy? to an attitude that sees someone very close to us from the same light that you see them, someone to love. You gave up so much to love us, Lord, and we got so much from your love. And in giving, you received. In giving up your life, you got it back. And that's the same way with us, Lord, when we truly give from our heart, when we yield, when we die to self, then in your own way, you give us back a life that is new and transforming. Teach us, Holy Spirit, to yield, to live with the principle of dying to self. Give each person facing difficult times courage so that we don't simply escape but so that we overcome in the name of the Lord we ask amen